Thank you. Right. Greetings, everyone. Are you okay? Yes. It's a beautiful day in Uma. It's always sunny when I come over. It's always sunny, lovely, cheerful, and it's warm, sort of. <laughs> At least the feeling. Towards a sustainable welfare nation. I've labelled my speech today, um, be the change you wish to see in the world, and I, I'm pretty sure you can reckon that. It comes from Mahatma Gandhi. Today I'll speak about choices, leadership and courage. But, I'd al but I will also like to describe briefly what the Swedish delegation is working with right now. I'll start with a picture you see behind me. I don't know if you've been there. I use this to question how civilizations rise and why they fall. This is Chichen Itza, and I'm sure you Maybe you've been lucky enough to have been there. That is El Castillo. Uh, it's a very famous building. Chichen Itza was a major focal point in the northern Maya lowlands. And it was great. Well, that kind of word is not today very nicely described because another man on this planet uses this very often. But it was a really great nation. It was a really great civilization as well. It, had, it held great economic power, it was densely clustered architecture, and the science when it came to math and architecture and agriculture was really profound and great. So how come this generation or this civilization or this uh, society, how come it could rise and then all of a sudden fall within two generations? To understand that, you must understand power dynamics, and you must understand environmental change. Because during a few years, there were drought, pressure came from society, how to sustain, live on, and create both food and create well-being and welfare. To understand power dynamics, then you need to understand how leadership and how the leadership cult was. Um, they held the power by three domains. First was science, very popular. Second was religion. And third was the football game. Very, 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 you, you can reckon that in some societies today as well, I assume. Anyhow, wrath uh, came, they, didn't, they couldn't bring any dr uh, more grain. So they had to fight each other to provide food and to keep on living. And uh, the football game, I'm sure you've heard of it. If I had a football team and Pia had one and my land was really dry, so I needed more land to feed my family, then I challenged you in the football game. And I said, if I win, I get the opportunity to kill all of your team members and if you win, then you get the opportunity to kill all of my team members. So that was one way of holding power. <coughs> Second then, that didn't work. All my team members got killed. Pia still wanted land. Then she had to sacrifice. Uh, so it's probably she would sacrifice her most beautiful daughter or her most beautiful son. So what happened? Is in, the, in this power dynamics. Well, nobody wanted to live under those kind of circumstances. You must understand that societies are not anything else but relation, us in between. So within two generations, it fell. It's really, under, it's really important to understand history and understand why we're here today, to understand what we need to do further on. To understand things, you must understand power dynamics, is my assumption. To understand racism, you need to understand power dynamics. To understand sexism, you must understand power dynamics. To understand poverty, you must understand power dynamics. And to understand power dynamics, then you need to listen and believe the story of the powerless. If the leaders of Chichen Itza would have had the opportunity to have understood the stories 
of the powerless, maybe this would have been a different kind of era. Let me introduce myself. My name is Ida Texel. I normally work as a chief fire officer, a chief executive officer in Stockholm. Uh, I'm also a member of the Swedish delegation uh, for transforming the Swedish work based on the UN's development goals. And I'll describe our work really briefly. Now at least you know where the exit signs is, so I can relax. But if any, in case of any emergency, you can just lean back. I'll take care of business, trust me, I do that regularly. In my daily life as a leader, you see, I've learned two things. And this is the red thread during my speech. I understand that we only have two things that we must do. Everything else is optional. In my background as an on-scene incident commander, I've learned a lot about the death. <laughs> it's uh, sad sometimes. But that's the only thing you must do, at least the first one. You must die. Everyone here in this room must die. The second part is you must make a choice. From my point of view, there's only these two musts. You must make a choice. You must uh, make a choice. If you choose not to eat, then unfortunately you might starve to death. So you have the privilege to make a choice. There are those people that does not have that kind of privilege. Be very humble about that insight. You have the opportunity to make a choice. When speaking of the delegation in our work, we always try to circulate around the question on what kind of human beings we are and what kind of choices we would like to make. And we try our very best to focus, you know, in affirmation times, to focus on what kind of world would we like to live in. And I would like just to open the room here in a very inclusive process by you turning to your neighbor just for a while, look each other in the eyes, and discuss what world would you like to live in? Please. Well, I just, um, I'm, I'm not sure. Do, do you normally sing when people are supposed to quit talking, or how do you do that? All right. Um, all right. <clears throat> all right. Umo. All right. It's a great energy, you know. I, I felt that I could walk out of the room and then you would have solved everything, you know. <laughs> Great energy. This is the question that we all must, you know, sort of collect our thoughts around. And the choices you make uh, and how you choose to do good, that to me, that is sustainability. Choices based on your own affirmation of where do you think that we should be in a Wiley. So you need to strip everything down to a very base, simple way of looking at yourself within a context. I'm normally out. I know you are really you know, into the 2030 agenda, and you know probably more than all the people in Sweden together. No, just kidding. But uh, sometimes when I'm out and talking to especially young women and boys and men and children, we need to un make them understand that they have a future, and it must be easy to address for them to understand how they can use their impact and gain the best opportunity for their own future. So don't make it complicated. Just go to your inner core and focus on what do you want to contribute with, and how strongly do you feel about that. Then you can make a revolution happen. Normally, in my daily business, that's exactly what we tend to do. In the Swedish Fire and Rescue Brigade, we don't consume very much and we don't produce very much. Our footprint is quite, you know, not that big. We try to minimize footprints by putting fires down. On the other hand, we have huge challenges when it comes to um, equality, uh, especially women and men. So every day, that's about what my leadership is about. You know, it's sometimes choices can be easy. And sometimes you know you must make a choice and it could be hard. I don't know if you reckon that. Low-hanging fruits are really good, but sometimes you must address 
the high-hanging fruit, so you must fight for it. So, I'll come to that in a while. Leadership, choices, and having, being courageous while making your choices is a really important part to do this very important transformation for the world. No more, no less. Uh, when it comes to the delegation in, it, in our work, we have, uh, based on our task, we have chosen a very inclusive process, and we have listening in. I know many of your stakeholders, uh, uh, my team colleagues, has been working a lot with you. We have tried to collect all the wisdom. We're not any expert at all. We try to collect wisdom. We try to create a picture. Our task is to present prioritized areas, suggest to the government, plan of action, and then translate the goals into a Swedish context. So what you see behind me is from the June report. You can find it at agenda 2030delegationen.se. Agenda 2030delegationen.se. Agenda 2030. I was supposed to do that in a rap version, but uh, my, my voice isn't that clear today. Agenda 2030delegationen.se. Agenda 23, yeah, well, you got it. You can read that, that's 134 pages with references. That is based on the inclusive process that we've chosen. You know, I'm not an expert on these 169 goals and the 17 main goals, but you are, based on your choices, your experiences and what you've learned during your lifetime. So we've been trying to collect that for one year. What we have chosen, we have presented targeted areas uh, which cluster, that's the first six, those sort of cluster what we think Sweden need to work with. I mean, are we fine in the goals or can we do even more? I don't know what your opinion is, but our opinion is that we must be brave and try harder. So what we found is that if we use this six prioritized areas, and address those, then Sweden could enhance, work better, and come further in the process, being a more sustainable country. The first one, an equal society. That's very important. And for some reasons, you can address that as looking at the child or the woman, 16 years old, walking through a society. When she or he or wherever is safe, feeling good, then there's a sort of ultimate way of looking at sustainability in many perspectives. So an equal society is very important. Sweden has challenges in this area. From my background, at least, we are 4% women working in a democratic-run business. That's way too bad. So we have a long way to go, for example. Second, sustainable cities and societies. That's really important as well, and that cluster many things when it comes to environmental change. The circular and social bef beneficial economy, that's the part that we really need to focus on as well. And I'm really glad to see many great uh, and creative projects run here. Strong private sector with sustainable business models is really important. To be really authentic all the way down, you know, words are easy, isn't it? You can mention that how green and sustainable you are. But the words are not the things that count. It's what you do, the choices you make, and the leader's plan of action when you act. Buzzwords is, well, I'm allergic to that. I did see a little, you know, medical booth over there. You should put buzzwords when it comes to sustainability, allergic reactions. Because that's one of the most important things to address. Authentic leaders that make decisions, that makes a change. For instance, low-hanging fruits, I can change to Ecopar, you know, from diesel in my vehicle. Because I have eight firehouse, firehouses, fire stations. I have, well, I think a hundred vehicles. No problem at all, you know. All my men and women thought that was a really good idea, go by Ecopar and reduce our footprint. 
And then I decided that all men and women, we should go through the recruitment process and the salary process, learnerprocessen, and all of a sudden hell broke loose. So you know, you know in your core business exactly what's the hot spot and what's the right questions to address, work with, with a true heart and a great passion. But you also know the low hanging fruits, please go grab them, but for crying out loud, don't be a chicken poop, leaving the most important matters behind. All right. So that comes along with the private sector, of course, but also with, the, with all the regional and local authorities that need to be aware of the authentic matters of this, these kind of questions. The fifth is sustainable and healthy food and supply chain. Um, I know there are people from Livsmedelsverket here today. Isn't that true? No. My fault then. Mea culpa. I thought that you are. Anyhow, Sweden now has really big challenges with obesity and for children uh, when it comes to food. That's a really f important matter to address as well. So during our stakeholder dialogues, this area came up really frequent. The enhanced knowledge and innovation. Well, you are sort of a creative hub here. You are really important for the future to create new solutions. And we also address that in the report. So these areas, they cluster the goals, as I mentioned, needed for the Swedish transformation. And we hope now that the Swedish government will handle these areas and get back to the delegation so we can deepen and keep going with our analysis to make a better plan of action for 2019. The suggested measures regarding these are those six areas where I would like to just address the last one when it comes to communication, public education and awareness. We have sort of realized that this transformation must be done with as, as many people as possible involved. Leave no one behind. Leave no one behind and please address the critical and important question and not only the low hanging fruits. Please make a step. So when it comes to Sweden in general, we've heard and got many different studies on how well aware people are about the 2030 agenda. And I'm sure you also can tell that we have a bit way to work when it comes to communication and awareness. So the delegation is really keen on that question and wish and hope for the, for the help of everyone to create this kind of discussion around what needs to be done. That involves, you know, really brave people as well. Sometimes it's hard to look at both short-sighted goals and long-sighted goals. So we have a time, well, um, time utmaning, time, what's utmaning? Challenge, thank you. Uh, sorry. We have a time challenge to address as well. Well, ladies, gentlemen, all in the room, everyone here, um, we continued in the, in the June report to also s suggest measures to the government. We wanted in particular to address education for children because we have a strong generation perspective in the report where you, uh, the report which you find at agenda 2030 delegationer.se. Uh, we have a strong generation perspective. There are opportunities to, well, have, have their own future and make their own choices. And we would like for the government to address the education as particular. We also see that we need to integrate 2030 in the regional growth policies and also in the com community planning. The local areas are really important. The work you do in UMI is great. I hope that many cities around and societies around could sort of get inspired by the wonderful work that you do. We need to continue that work by sharing ideas, co-creation. So not only co-creation within UMI, but also in a national context. Because as far as we reckon, during these two years, we sort of spot that 
the sharing in between, stealing good ideas and creating good uh, strategies and policies together could get much, much better. So co-creation nationwide is important for Sweden as well. For our <laughs> part, uh, it, it comes down to that we need to identify areas uh, of operation demanding collaboration between municipalities, as I mentioned, in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. We need to make, give the opportunity to municipalities to get support, to be challenged, to get inspired, to feel energy, and all that. Because the municipalities have a great opportunity to move further here, but they need some support and some help. And I'm really delighted and honored to be here in Umu because you, you do great work. I must stop saying great. I feel like, normally I like that word, now I don't anymore, so uh, m m my fault. All right, now what? What's happening now? Now you know a li little bit about the delegation, what we've done, and you know a little bit of what we've suggested. You also know now where you can find the report. It's at <laughs> at least one. Yes, Agenda 2030. Did you Google it? Yes, some of you did. Good. Um, so what will we do now? We will keep supporting and stimulating the implementation. We will go even further, together with you and many colleagues, uh, to focus on our six prioritized areas. What could we do better to do this transformation? We also keep the dialogue going with our stakeholders, and we try to do a, a more updated report right now. So in March 2018, there will come a more deep analysis report coming out. And in March 2019, then we're supposed to deliver our final report. So our task is all the way through 2019. That's the deal. I mentioned earlier that as I said I will speak a little bit more about courage and leadership because that's a crucial focal point for doing this transformation. How many in this room feels like a leader? Raise your hand. I'm still waiting. Everyone could go on. Is it because that's an interesting question. We normally ask that when we're out. I'm glad to see so many hands. You are a leader, even if you want it or not. Because leaders and leadership, from my point of view, is inspiring and interacting with your context. Whether you want it or not, you interact and you interfere with colleagues, friends, family, children, people, society, networks, internet, arenas. You are more important than you think. I can't address that in, an, an, in any other way. You are probably the most important person in the whole world to do this transformation. Because if I wouldn't say so, I would have given you the excuse to step away when the difficult question comes. In the Fire and Rescue Service, where I'm right now, my task for four years has been to encourage people to make a stand. I have 275 employees. They could easily run my organization without me. My most important task as a leader is to encourage and inspire people to make them step forward and feel happy about it. So never doubt the impact you have on your own environment, on your friends, on your family, on your networks, and in your life. You are the most important person, both in your life and in this transformational process. I sort of plead to you to take your responsibility and make a stand. And I would have done so if I would have spoken to the politicians and the parliament. Because in these times, making a stand and being courageous when things are hard will be the most crucial part of delivering the 2030 Agenda. 
And during that journey, it's okay to be afraid sometimes, but you must make a stand and a choice. My son describes this better than nobody else. I don't know if you heard the story. I went to Mötesplatz Social Hållbarhet in June. I don't know, I know at least one person was there because I said hello to you. Was anyone else there? No. Good, then you haven't heard the story. You see, when it comes to making decisions and making actions and making things happen, happening, then sometimes it could be hard or it could be easy. And when things are hard, you sort of sometimes feel a little bit uncomfy. And maybe you doubt your own capacity. I have two children. I have a boy, his name is Sixten. He turned nine a few weeks ago. And I have a daughter, her name is Stella. Sixten is, um, he's not autistic. But when he was a little child, people thought he was autistic. My father is from Finland, and my grandfather fought the Finnish Winter War. So he's quite lacunisk. So we got that Finnish kind of quietness within us. And with Sixten, my son, that's really obvious. He doesn't speak very much. But he likes to draw. He's, he's amazing with the Lego. And he, he likes to draw. So when he was four, he got really upset because the angles, he drew a house, and the angles weren't correct. So his, his, um, well, his, his teachers, they got really concerned because a four-year-old bo boy shouldn't concern about angles, but he did. Uh, he is not autistic, he's just a little bit Finnish, we always say. <laughs> uh, so anyhow, uh, his, his sister, Stella, she's quite extrovert. She has four boyfriends at kindergarten and school, and she has many friends. And she, one day, she dreams of being the first uh, female supreme commander. And I have not been projecting this on her, I assure you. Uh, it came down with, uh, she saw, you know, doing Aurora, it was a great military exercise. She saw, you know, really beautiful gray helicopters from NATO flying, flying over. And she said, oh, I love those helicopters. One day I'll be chief of those. And I can fly as much as I want. Uh, and I got a little bit, you know, well, was the, uh, did I raise her? Well, I obviously did. Anyhow, now I'll tell you the story about being brave and afraid sometimes, because nobody else expresses this better than my son. He was seven years old. They had just learned to swim. They went to swimming school and did really try to swim. And they, to get the little mark, you had to first swim breast uh, stroke, thank you. And then after that, you were supposed uh, to jump into a deep water four meters and then get up to the surface and swim into the, to, to, the, to the side. So, to get the mark, everyone lined up after doing the breath stroke, breast strokes, and they were supposed to jump into the water. So, first child, boof, and the teacher, he crossed. Yes, good. Very good. And then, <clears throat> next child came, and he, very good. And then my son came, and I must mention that he got a Lego tourney, uh, just a few weeks ago, before this incident, where he had builded all the horses and all the knights, and he had re been really proud of himself. He came out, stepped into the, looked into the water, and then he went back and sat down. I was sitting on a chair just behind, and he sat down next to me, sat quiet for a while, and I felt like, oh, now, he didn't make the mark. I didn't say anything, but he felt it. Every person sort of connects and interacts without saying things. You interact with me now, even if you don't say anything. And he, he probably felt that I was a little bit disappointed and sad. So he said, Mom, life is like a tourney. You know, you have one horse, and on that you have courage. And on the other, you have fear. And today, unfortunately, fear won. Uh, but don't worry, there will come another day, and then courage will win. <laughs> Is that? And you know, and I can sort of, when I, sp <laughs> when I speak of this, I, said, I had to write it down, you see, because he was so wise. He was seven. And he's absolutely right about what he said. 
Life is hard sometimes. Sometimes you're afraid when you're supposed to make a stand. And sometimes it's easy. But please, use your capacity and your energy and your passion to make a stand. If you feel courageous today, go with the flow, go with passion. And if you feel fear, don't worry, because tomorrow you will be filled with courage. All right, that was everything that I had to say. Thank you.